Welcome back to High Performance Computing. Uh, this is the part two of our practical lecture 1.1. And this is about introduction to C programming, scheduling, understanding batch processing. And in the first part, we looked, looked already what is the key ingredient of a C program. So of course, this is a very simple C program called Hello World. But we also prepared a little bit the environment for using already open MPI. So that is of course something what we want to do on HPC systems in the next couple of lectures. But this lecture is sort of a small short introduction to C programming and scheduling. And as such, we covered in the first part really just the very little basics how to compile uh, basically a simple C program that we then also later in the lecture two, for instance, now coming tomorrow, um, we will extend also with some MPI directives to make it a valid MPI program. So in this sense, a valid MPI program is always in that sense also a valid C program or a Fortran program. And that was also what we covered a little bit in the first part of the lecture. So the question was why we think about C, why not Java, why not um, other languages, basically like Python, which is very popular. Um, Python is very popular in deep learning, machine learning, and these sorts of things. While you see that traditional simulation science is code, when we want to simulate the reality with HPC systems using uh, basically numerical methods based on known physical laws, that's what we do. So there are lots of C programs, um, C++, also lots of fort run programs still in the realm of HPC that use parallel computing in the extent of what we also had a little bit reviewed in the first part of the lecture, uh, which was about using essentially two paradigms like distributed memory in combination often with shared memory programming. In other words, you use the MPI standard implementation, perhaps open MPI, as we did in the first part, and then combine it with open MP, which is one of the shared memory implementation that we can use also here later in the course and we will in one of our assignments. So based on the material we had in the first part today, now let's look a little bit on what we did wrong in the first part. And when I say wrong, and it is basically a little bit saying that if you have really large scale weather forecast simulations, if you have crash tests and CFD, if you have lots of different simulations, in the realm of physics, usually you don't want to execute them on the login node. If you remember, we had Hello World, we compiled this interesting C code, and it was working, sometimes with a line break, sometimes without. But the key message to take away is we didn't really use a scheduler yet. And you will find that when you go to your HPC joint undertaking HPC systems, um, most all of them are basically running a scheduler. If you go to HPC systems around in the world, in China, in the US, you will find that basically people use schedulers and batch systems. And the second part of this lecture will basically now pick up on this problem that we said we don't want to execute on the login node. Maybe just a little bit of compiling is okay and some tests and some checks is okay. But the real big execution across many different nodes, scaling up to lots of different CPUs or even many cores when you think about accelerating them as GPU C applications, we basically want to use a scheduler and a batch system. So let's fast new seatbelt and see where this interesting system software now comes into play. So one of the ideas of this deep project that we will also basically touch base in the course is essentially having this modular supercomputing system. And this was a kind of deep series of projects that developed this modular supercomputing systems. And you will find that today applications have real requirements for different needs, requirements for different HPC systems really, or system architectures. That's why basically a modular aspect of a supercomputer was created in these projects, which we also will leverage when we basically uh, use a deep system in the projects that we have in our assignments. So in this sense, it's a good example of thinking already a little bit about the scheduling idea, maybe from a 10,000 feet perspective. 
that there are different users using this HPC systems. You see these are usually multi-user systems filling a whole hall of different racks, and they all use it in one respect very similar. So they all have, of course, uh, needs for computing power. But on the other hand, many of these applications have different requirements. Some use more the accelerators, others are more memory bound, others need lots of CPUs. So by addressing the idea of having these different modules um, and the idea of having this different flavor of applications, basically you have the idea that we see here, which was we implemented initially in Jülich, more of more a general purpose line <clears throat> showing you also from practical experience going back to when I started in Jülich in 2004, maybe 2003, 2004, uh, maybe a bit early as a student. But then you basically said like um, you had always these two ideas how you go from there, because one of them is much more general purpose clusters, really. And another one was really the highly scalable codes that you do. And there were different implementations and different systems, which connects nicely, hopefully a little bit to the idea we have in lecture one to make it a practical lecture one one, but still thinking about how the evolution is so quickly from teraflops up to petaflops, right? So this is already oddness of magnitudes in computing strength and power. In the middle, of course, data is always relevant. So GPFS, which is an EBM system for a parallel file system, or Luster, where you can parallel, you know, write and read into files. That's something which is not obvious to you. We will see how that materialized when we look in the MPIIO interface and the subsequent lectures coming basically from tomorrow. But you see also that this world of HPC is evolving very quickly over the years. And see here already how we now basically go to our today's idea of having this and where this idea of a modular supercomputer where you really need this different sort of modules in the Juvels cluster and Juvel scalable one. And now basically see we continue this trend in the more recent systems and basically also the exascale system Jupiter will be derived from those models. Um, this is something where you basically have different modules. One is much more the cluster module with general purpose and then one of the boosters, so to speak, where you think about really having something highly scalable, lots of GPUs available and so on. So what I'm saying is it goes back quite some while to have this and in the end, what I want to practically bring in this practical lecture is that these systems need to be developed. They are prototype systems. Um, HPC is not at all buying a laptop somewhere in a, let's say, um, normal manufacturer and you go there, buy the laptop, everything is nice and shiny. These systems are here and there in the beginning, very much research projects. They have to be, you know, basically prepared for working and basically installing all the system software, getting then the benchmarks first to hopefully lead in the top 500 a good place. But then also think about more importantly, perhaps all the different applications. And that is the point now to the practical lecture one one that I want to to basically motivate with this. So the key message is here multi users, because you cannot afford such a system if just one users pay and say, well, that's a nice application. Let's just go for a big HPC system. Usually these happy HPC systems and this is a graph graphic here that a little bit alludes to it. So you see here different supercomputers, the Jureka cluster module, the Jureka booster module, or even the Jewel system, where all of these different little pieces represent different users that share the same computing system. And this sharing is loaded, you can imagine. So everybody has different amounts of GPUs or CPUs they use. They submit their job, and this is something what we will learn today, submit their job in different times during the day, during the week. So all of this needs to be in isolation from each other. So it's a really multi-user environment we're talking about. And here's the idea is how you can now basically organize all of this, right? What you see here is not really a schedule, it's more a mon monitoring system called LLView. So it shows you also the load of the different system at a particular point in time. It also shows you a little bit that if you think that these are all the racks in a virtual fashion, then you see they're almost 
100% filled, hopefully, but also mostly in production. In other words, <clears throat> in a way, you see the most important screen here, though, that shows that the systems are really used by very, very, very many different users. And it could be different users of all sorts of things. So it may be, as I was alluding to before, the simulation sciences with using several numerical methods and weather forecast and then that is based on numerical methods based on num based on known physical laws but then you go next door and suddenly there's a deep learning applications next door in the sense of of course the next rack or the next node what you see here basically in the different colors so it could be that one user is doing simulation sciences um, mpi applications and suddenly the next application just in the next rack or the next node is suddenly something that you see here, a unit based on deep learning is not obvious to you. We will see how that materializes when we come to the deep learning lecture. But you see that also deep learning, machine learning, AI, data sciences also now leverages this HPC systems. And you see how nicely that works. You have here a prototype system deep, but also the Jubal's booster with lots of GPUs. And what we do in HPC and that's very important now for you to understand more and more as we dive into the material of the lecture. We speed up basically the training here or the runtime of the application more broadly speaking. But you see here the time per epoch and you see that with the deep system and the Jubal's booster if you have just one number of GPU. So that will take quite long. And many of you are basically familiar with this using workstation clients or so. But then what we do in HPC is usually have more and more number of GPUs added. So this is a starter diagram if you want to see, of course, with one GPU versus 16. I also can significantly break down the time of training a neural network or basically also then of course significantly uh, even the inference. So these are topics called distributed deep learning. We will hear more about this later in the course. Just to take away the message yet, these supercomputers are used for very many different applications. And that's why we talk to them, or as we define them actually more precisely as a multi-user environment with different application domains where they use day in and day out, basically filling the system hopefully to 99.9 .9 almost always. Um, of course, the scheduler is now the one responsible for achieving this, to have this 99.9. .9. Um, always filled, of course, the users that really submitting their jobs that want to execute are one part of the story. But another one is who is actually managing all of these different ideas of running applications at the same time from many different users across the system. This brings us to the LLVU system. So this is not really a scheduler yet, but it shows you more precisely what's the load of the system and examples. So if you would have a system like these racks you can model them of course virtually and having them as different racks with mid planes and so on the detail here is to some regard of course important but for you here in the beginning of the course not really directly uh, let's say very essential you see that some services might be out offline here in terms of racks or some of them have maybe in maintenance or others have, let's say, very large scale jobs um, that fill a lot of parts of the machine. Here we see now that basically a specific user might be on a specific part of the machine and at a specific point in time scheduled, right? So below here, you see some schedule. So that basically represents over time how the machine will have to tackle new applications that have been given to the scheduler. And at the point in time with a timeline, you see usually the system should be almost 99% filled because they're very costly systems and you really want to use them as much as you can. And that is exactly what the idea of a scheduler uh, is and what the goal of a scheduler is to really try to have at time zero, if you want, uh, latest, really the, the kind of supercomputer filled to 99%, at least to its whole capacity with computational jobs which basically, of course, can be any point in time, any application. So in other words, it's quite hard for a schedule to, to know. You know, we as users can every time submit jobs to a supercomputer. The scheduler is just happily sitting there and waiting for jobs. 
um, that we can then display here in this LLVU user environment. But the scheduler then at the end has to reserve certain number of nodes, certain number of cores, maybe even many cores and GPUs in order to get this application executed. Now, at the same time, there might be five, six other users that also want to execute the job. So if you don't reserve a node, you share it suddenly with many others, this wouldn't work. So the capacity is not there. The many core system would be not really having its full efficiency, switching always among different jobs. So the scheduler makes sure to have a so-called sandbox. You would say, this is a sandbox that is reserved for one particular application for a particular amount of time. And that is our requirement that we then will have to the scheduler as a user to say, I want a job which is this one in this executable, maybe hello world, very trivial, maybe a weather forecast for 24 hours. So hence the scheduler has to digest what we need as users and then came up with a schedule which really you know, serves in a way everyone very well of uh, basically using the machine to its full potential, if possible. And this has something to do with scheduling policies and many others. And what you see basically now um, is a bit different what we had in the last practical lecture. There we actually focused a lot on the operating system. If you remember Unix, new folders, directories, files, and so on. In this lecture, we focus much more on these part of the operating system environment of HPC systems. The monitoring system you have already seen, that was the LLVU system. You have seen already Ganglia. Let me remind you what that was again. That was exactly when we have here, for instance, the UTIN usage set, where we had this login node, the compute nodes, compute 20, 21, 2223. And basically now we want to understand as part of the kind of lecture today is how I can move my load now from the login node that you already know, the UTIN itself as a login node, and how I ship now jobs basically to these different compute nodes. This is a concept called scheduling, and it's basically something where um, scheduling system and monitoring systems are very close, right? Why they almost look the same, it's not really true. The monitoring is really checking the system. So where's the rec down? Where are the jobs? Where are the applications running? On which node, on which rack, on which mid-plane, whatever it is, uh, on which course? Um, this is monitoring. Now, when you talk about scheduling and Slurm, for instance, is a very famous scheduling that we will use on the Uton cluster. <clears throat> it will leverage this concept of batch queues. It will have different scheduling algorithms to check, you know, basically who is now allowed to come first. There are interesting smart concepts like backfilling. So if there's a hole in the schedule somewhere, and a future user that basically came way later than others has submitted a small job that maybe fit in that little hole. This basically little hole will be filled by this job, even if it's far later submitted than others, but it fits so nicely in the hole, more or less something we call backfilling, so that the system is still at, you know, basically to the same time always filled as much as possible. So hence the scheduling systems primarily working on the idea of really managing all of these different concurrent users that we have on the supercomputer at the same time submitting these applications. And the word submitting is loaded, so I can understand that some of you don't really understand now what the idea of the submit is. Submit to a batch queue, submit a job, an application to a batch queue, just merely means like you inform the scheduling system, I want to run an application on my quota, please do so on the next occasion when there's a free slot in the schedule. And of course, now the scheduler has to operate and it operates according to several scheduling principles, sometimes also more or less policies if you want, um, because they're not really more or less like your laptop that you know perhaps from you know Java programming or even C-sharp programming on your kind of device that you have in front of you in a very interactive way. Typically, these ideas of the supercomputers are much more um, start the process at some time in the future. Um, we basically use for this something we call a job script. So we tell the scheduler in some point in time, please, when the schedule is right, start this particular elements which are in the job script. 
So JavaScript is a terminology at the end of the course you really should know by heart, I hope. And we will do some application examples here. And the scheduling then is basically what you see a little bit here from the monitoring system. But the scheduling system will then make sure that what you have in the job script will be executed at some point in time when the amount of cores or nodes or whatever resource requirements you specified will be free. Hence, the schedule has also some certain job of really making free of the time of the people that actually submitted a job or basically asked for a job via the job script. In other words, there's, for instance, a scheduling principle like first come, first serve, which seems to be natural, right? So basically thinking like there's a user, he wants to submit jobs on this computer, and because he submitted it two hours before the other users, his job will come first. Somehow logical. However, as I also alluding to in the last slide, backfilling is there also where you think about that sometimes maybe there's a hole in the scheduler or gaps, as we would call them, and maybe people that actually submitted way later in the process maybe can be actually for earlier run because there's still some space which the scheduler can fill to have the optimal performance of the system leverage the service to the optimal degree towards as i said 99.9 percent .9%. so hence the scheduler is a little bit flexible and i mean before talking too long on this let's go in really practical details um, it's a fascinating topic. You would say there's even completely lectures on it, scheduling policies, or even people doing just a PhD on that. Let's look how that looks a little bit more in practice. We have the same way. We go to our Krafla environment um, because our teaching cluster is in the university network. That means, and this error that is always coming here and so on with the X11 forwarding, um, that's not so much important for us. We don't have a really big remote display and I will increase the font site here as usual to just let you know more about it and the things that I will explain now uh, with a job script that I call submit hello today is basically taking or leveraging the elements that we had in the first part of this lecture right when we think about C programming so for those of you who just hit this video it maybe makes sense to also look at the first part of this video to make the connection but it's not so hard to understand. And once we have been actually logging into Krafla, being in the university network, we are now able to again log into Uton. This is our teaching cluster for the demonstrations, also for the assignments, at least part of the assignments. And as we are there, we want to go into our 2023 HPC course directory. Uh, we have the MPI directory, if you know, from the last time where we already had the hello as an application. And we will fill this directory more and more with other applications over time in this course. Now, the message we had was hello point C point hello point C has the hello uh, C program file, really how I program. We had here edit in the first part, a line break, sometimes not, sometimes yes. And so the difference in the output, we compiled it with a command like MPICC, and we learned that with the up arrow, we can really nicely go through the history of this, which helps us maybe sometimes to find commands which are very useful. But like this one, we said MPICC, hello.c minus o hello. But before you even do this, you should basically recognize that we always have to use the modules first, right? Don't, don't actually forget that. So first module load GNU open MPI, and then I can compile with the command we have just here with the MPICC. That interestingly enough brought us to the hello file. And I will just demonstrate this again, module load glue, and then we basically will here have our MPICC compiling that again, just to make the connection to the first part of the course. And then we have our newly part here um, that we basically have on 1916 here, the same as the time I was basically doing this here. But now the emphasis is more on the job script. The job script is essential to give it to the scheduler later. So we, let's look into that, what, how it looks like. You see here one example of a job script, which is very small. So the s -batch is a specific directive here in a typical script of the Unix level that says just how the job name is. Hello example. You can do everything here. 
which somehow reflects also how the job is called. So I re would recommend you, it should be a bit reflecting what you're executing. Then the number of cores with a small n is one. So a very tiny job, just one core, not really parallel computing. As I was saying, we will start this from tomorrow on with MPI. So here, please bear with me here. We just try to have an executable executed somewhere on the HPC machine on a compute node instead of a locked in node in order to capture the essence of scheduling. Parallel computing will start tomorrow with MPI lecture two, and then we go from there. When this basically job, as we call it, or the application of the HPC system is finished, that is what this is saying, mail type end, then I want to get an email. Though you can also have some certain very convenient features given in the script that the scheduler will do for you, like informing you, hey, your job has been finished. Very important to understand is that in this job, when the scheduler is executing what you want them to execute, and the best to understand this is probably this one, we have been executing this before interactively, if you remember, basically without the scheduler. So it's the same executable we're talking about, compiled, but we, of course, to execute this, need also the same modules. So basically, a job script can contain module loads in the same environment where it was compiled. And here, the MPI run will then also make sure to distribute this across the cluster. This is a topic that we will explore in Lecture 2 and Practical Lecture 2.1. So let's wait for this in a moment. Here, of course, we know with one core, there's not much to parallelize. So here, we want to understand just how the scheduler is used. So step by step, we going here forward. Hence, the job script is relatively straightforward. Obviously, it's a very simple job script and directly refers to the modules that we had used before and to the executable we have built before. Hence, when we have that here in the directory, it's important that you specify the very correct executable, right? When you and, and that's why, from practical experience, it's so important to have this hierarchy of all these folders right. If you have a, let's say, other version of the Hello World program, maybe it makes sense to have it in another directory. I mean, basically, practically speaking, if you have a large application and you tune it, you actually work on it, it makes sense to have maybe versioning of that in different folders and so on. Advanced people would even use GitLab for that or Git repositories these days, but it's important to understand that the location of this executable matter for the scheduler, right? So this is what is being executed. And this is basically not anymore on the login cluster or login part of the cluster, but more on the compute nodes. And that's what exactly we want to do by using a very specific command, which is interestingly enough, sbatch. Now, before I execute here on sbatch, this particular submit, um, let us review again and go into the subscript because you have seen that before the S batch, right? This is more or less the connection here that you see to what I do on the command line versus what's in the script. So these are directly commands for the scheduler so that the scheduler knows this is a thousand core job, a 2000 core jobs, a 20 node job, the resource requirements. And this can be extended and we will do so in the next couple of lectures when we go more advanced that this is already informs the schedule about more or less meta information. So who is the user? Who should get some mail? How's the job name? What is basically the number of cores or maybe nodes if you have capital M? Um, and this is more or less the concrete information directly. What should I now execute in this particular environment and the number of nodes that you have or the number of cores? Hence, it's a, a little bit on a different level as also the color encoding suggests. And when we do this now and say sbatch, submit hello world, sbatch. And again, I think here, at least in this part of the course, I would recommend to you do something which is like obvious. Like you see here, I named the submit hello script in a way as a submit script. So you're here giving it to the scheduler and want to know if that's really there. And when you submit this job to the scheduler, one thing will happen, which is of very important to you. It will give you a job ID. This job ID is incredibly important because one thing you firstly notice is I don't get any output. Once again, connecting also what we did before, right? In the lecture uh, part before we had this hello, you know, um, executed. 
and we got hello world. Now I ask Bidget and don't get a hello world. So what's happening? The idea is that this batch system will basically submit it at some point in time. So maybe the supercomputer is full for the next six hours. So you don't want to wait in front of the screen for six hours. So what you do is basically you happily go back, take your coffee, you go home. Um, and maybe in the next day in the morning, you come back and your job has been processed. The processing of the job and to get more information about the job is, is really lots of tool sets which the scheduler provides you. One example is, for instance, QSTAT, where you should see that I actually executed two jobs right now to this queue. And the job ID helps us now to differentiate between them. And this job ID will then help us also to get the output of the job, which you're now most curious about, because this is not really an output I can work with. I submitted batch job number, whatever. I'm not interested in that. I want to see hello world. So that's the point of batch submission. So it disconnects a little bit from this interactive way that you used to perhaps into a more batch processing way. At some point in time, your queue says your job is done. So then it will be executed and the output will be made available in another file. And the way how I use and find then this file is the job ID for this particular job. And that's best explained if we maybe clear a little bit here our screen and do an ls l you will see that for these two job IDs, right? If I connect them now to the status of the scheduler with a job ID 39 at the end, you see an output with 39 at the end. With basically 040 at the end, you see an output of 3040 in the end. So very obvious, we said the job name should be called hello example. We have seen this, I am Morris apparently on the system and actually the time uses very little because it's a very trivial application. And the status here is completed in the normal queue. So just an example of what you can see, there's more elaborate example with something, uh, for instance, when you show Joe job ID, for instance, maybe very verbose, and then you would just take this and would basically get more information even out of this job um, such as on which exactly compute node it was running. But this is something what you already know. We know Uton has a compute 0. Uh, 2.0, right? 2.0, which directly relates us to the idea that we were using compute 2.0. And look at this, what was running here. You see a little bit when you go to the details that suddenly instead of zero before, um, we used actually compute zero. Uh, 2.0 and or 2-0 and the same is true also then for 2.1 so you will see that in the monitoring system directly that someone is actually using the compute um, you know nodes because the schedule was taking care of shipping this to this particular nodes and here it's just one call we asked for so not different nodes which we would do with capital M Catching back now, basically, a little bit what we had on the slides um, to think now how that were all working. This graphic might explain it a bit nicely. We have submitted this batch, um, you know, script. And at some point in time, that is what's happening. Um, you basically, from the login node, submitted this to the scheduler with this sbatch command. The scheduler will interpret what you wrote here in the job script as kind of command parts. And then um, we'll basically do at some point in time when the schedule is right, execute what you see here with the ideas given up, which in our case is just one course or so no big deal. But of course, with the job ID that we have here, we will basically execute this. We will have the hello world executed. It will print something out. This outed um, or this, this kind of printout is not available on the screen, but in an output file. So it drops it to disk under the slurm id that we had as a job id so that would match so in order to find back your hello world in the out basically output of this job and let's look this maybe a little bit practically uh, when we look now here in this directory there's no surprises um, again there are two outputs because if you remember in the queue what i submitted were just two i think one is already removed because the time passes and with this, we basically see um, that we can maybe still 
even if it's not anymore on the scheduler because the scheduler will forget at some point in time the old jobs. But still, of course, the file system hasn't forgot about it and we have our hello world inside. So very interesting, disconnecting a little bit the interactive access that you have um, from basically this batch submit that we basically learned. And if you now think about that a weather forecast will maybe take 36 hours to compute, that's what you do. You would just, you know, simplify, you would say, okay, I've con maybe compiled my weather forecast and now I will execute it again. And let's say you maybe modify the hello world or this weather forecast application again with some parameters. So you submit it again and then you do some parameter setups again with some input file and you submit it again and again and again and again. Obviously, now the schedule should be much more fuller, right? So I, I already submitted now more and more jobs and you see how that works. Interestingly enough, in the moment, I'm the only user here, but if someone else, and that's what you probably will see when you're doing your assignments, you will see in the queue different users, not only Morris as it is here. In the assignment, you will see different user identities always having different jobs executed. So quite interestingly, you see also, because it's a very simple job, again, these have been you know, basically finished almost immediately. It's not much to do, just printing out hello world in the file. Hence, what we now would expect is a lot of output files that should have this particular identity. And let's check if that's really true. I see more and more output files are generated. You see also the size is almost equal in everyone. So that suggests that almost the same information is in. And no matter where we just look, more is another command what we can use here. For instance, you see hello world, no matter which different job I click here. And this is basically executed in the batch way. So it's very quickly then how you can fill a system by using S batch a lot. Of course, you should also think about then switching job parameters, not like I did here, just always the same thing, always submitting the same thing. That is almost nonsense. But of course, in a real application, you would have the weather forecast for a different region. You would have the weather forecast maybe with different parameters. Um, you have different ideas how you can have these applications. And more notably, which is now interesting, um, it will manage also the different users on the system. So even if there are many different at the same time using the system, um, this will be very important to understand then that these systems will be kind of really nice scheduled. And you see here, for instance, in Compute 2.0, as we know from the S control command, around the time we have now Basically, you see that compute 2.0 was used and before 2.1 was used. And this is basically us now submitting different jobs here to the system. And this is just the monitoring part. As I said, the schedule works always this way. And you can basically have the same idea that you see here with the output, um, then also transfer to much larger applications that we will face in the future. And more notably, this is something where you know, the system administrators that you see a little bit here in former times, we have now a couple of new system administrators. That's really the right way to do it. Use the scheduler. You see login node only for checks in the system uh, to edit, you know, and compile maybe here and there some C programs, but don't really execute a lot and long jobs on the U to an, uh, login cluster or in any other cluster. We have seen the deep system. It's also not there. The login node to really execute a lot of things. You would do this with a scheduler there as well. There's also Slurm, and even that is then the interesting part. It's a so-called de facto standard if you want in the community. So you switch different systems and you can also do another clusters as batch in order to basically then submit your jobs. But this is something which will materialize in future parts of these lecture series. So basically in lecture two, we will start with real parallel programming. This was just the warm up for you to getting acquainted with C programming and scheduling. The next time we really start in lecture two is parallel programming. So see you next time.